Hey everybody, how you all doing? Today I'm with my friend, the great saxophonist from New York City, Gene Gee. Gene and I have a an incredible connection of both having studied with the great Mr. George Coleman. And he called me just the other day about something I posted on Facebook. We hadn't seen each other, I guess, since a couple years ago when we were playing down with the Harlem Renaissance Orchestra in Pennsylvania, if I remember. And I put up on, uh, anyway, Gene, how you doing before I start? How you doing, Gene? I'm doing great, Marshall. How are you? Hey, man, I'm, I'm, I wish I'm doing as good as you, brother. <laughs> 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 these, are, these are some different times we're all in. You know what I'm saying? Yes, we are. Yeah, man. You would, you would, it, it's good to see you. I hadn't seen you in a long time since that. that Same here. That, that yes. trip down to Pennsylvania. We had a good time laughing and. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> You know, mm -hmm. uh, that was a heavy, heavy time. Uh, you, you would, you would called me on the phone, and I put up it's something. So I put up something on Facebook where I stated, "I'm just going to read it." Fact: Count Basie was a blues and dance band. Musicians, where's the dance in today's jazz? Do you hear it? And then you, you actually, you were so moved by that, you called me up and called me caught me by surprise so i wanted to take off on that but why did you why did you call me that that was it yesterday two days ago and and it hit me because that's where it's at i mean like when i started playing jazz we had a band in high school it was, a, it was called dance band you know I, we didn't really play for dances but it was a, it's called dance band and the band i played after school we played for dances and proms. I played for my own prom, which my date didn't particularly like it. But um, it was a chance to play for people my age. They enjoyed it. They partied to it. They danced to it and had a good time. So that's what music is to me. Makes you feel good. Feel good music. Make you tap your feet. If you can't tap your feet, it's, it's dealing with the intellect. I like it to deal with the soul, spirit. Hmm. That's what jazz is to me. And, that, and that's what got me into it. It wasn't that I heard somebody playing some fancy passages and and it was it was um, just fast or just incredible. It was the feeling, it was the soul that got to me. Yeah, but, but I, you know, look, I completely agree, man. I, I you know, I think um, I came up a little later than you. I'm a little younger. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, I. Uh, I started out on classical music, but then uh, honestly, what I did join what they called the stage band. You remember that the stage? Yeah. Band. Mm -hmm. And it it was funny. I did an interview with Lou Tobacco, and I had I hadn't realized that he told me so. You know, they didn't have stage bands or jazz bands at school when I came up. He told me <laughs> so I, I, mm -hmm. I never thought of that. He said that yeah. was a new thing for y'all. You know, because I told him I we had his the his he and his wife's arrangements in the band. Right. But but anyway, yeah. Um, I first heard David Sanborn first, mm -hmm. a college kid to give me his record. And I was just moved by the music, you know, then I had Grover Washington, Ronnie Laws, and then I found a Charlie Parker record. It was live at Mossy Hall. Mm -hmm. And I, I didn't understand it at all. You know what I'm saying? Right, right. But I just knew I liked it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so mm -hmm. I put that on every night when I went to bed. Is that what you're talking about? Getting that feeling of just joy of just, you know. Yeah. You know, actually my father had, um. He had the Count Basie records and Duke Ellington. I loved that the big band sound. And my first influence actually was Benny Goodman. I started on clarinet at age nine years old in fourth grade. But at that time, I couldn't play anything like him. It was so difficult. But I played pretty well in clarinet. I majored in clarinet when I first went to college. But then the summer of my freshman high school year, I had been listening to Count Basie all the time, Duke Ellington. I love that music. But I pulled out a record that my father had by Gene Ammons called Boss Tenor. Hmm. That changed my life. It was in August, I think it was 1963. I put on Hitting the Jug. That hit me. <coughs> Canadian Sunset. Um, confirmation. <clears throat> Excuse me. It was an excellent record, and that's what I said. I wanted to play saxophone, 
my father, they rented a, um, a Buescher saxophone for me. I learned it, all yeah. the scales and all the notes on the horn in one week because I had played clarinet. So that was my beginning playing saxophone. And Gene Ammons is the one who started me. <laughs> I've heard yeah. that. From, I've heard that from so many people, man. I know Doug Doug yeah. Lawrence, Doug Lawrence. You know Doug Lawrence from the Basie Band told me, told right. me Gene Ammons, man, Gene Ammons. And that's funny when when I got into back at, in Pittsburgh, I bought the record. I think it was Gene Ammons live with Groove Holmes. Was it? Yeah. Is that the one? Mm-hmm. Jug with Groove Holmes. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> that's when we had records. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Man, I, there was a one track where, where they went through the all keys on the blues. You remember that? Mm-hmm. To- no, Jack, Jack McDuff, who I played with in 1974, he told me that um, you know, he played with Gene Evans and Sonny Stick. You know, he said Sonny Stick played all the snakes and slick stuff he played, and people applauded. He said Jug came, he had his shoes were turned over. He played one note, and the people just fell out. And, and Sonny Stick got mad, but you know, they loved each other, you know. But it was just that one note, a soul, you know, and, and it just it just hit people in the soul, you know. So that to me is the most important thing. That sound, the soul, the feeling. So that that that's what I've made I've been making a series of comments on Facebook lately. Lately I've posted over and over again about sound. Mm-hmm. I I said something my brother taught me when I was younger. He, he he's a musician also. Mm-hmm. And uh then he told me once he said, Marshall, the most important part of your playing is gonna be your sound. That's what yeah. people are gonna recognize. They don't know anything about the notes you playing. You know, that's right. if, that's it, right. if you play a bunch of scientific stuff, they won't really care. But if you got a mm-hmm. sound that's beautiful, they're just gonna like it. Yeah. Yeah. And 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 the one reason I've been commenting on this, as you and I talked about on the phone, it seems in a lot of the younger generation, and I I hate to point to the colleges, you know, because Mm -hmm. I like college. I appreciate college. I like to go to college. It's not about that, you know. Mm -hmm. Um there's something really missing to me, you know. Mm -hmm. And so when I when I talked about the dance, a lot of people were confused. They thought I was talking about dancing. But see, when mm-hmm. I, when I talked to Lionel Hampton and Jackie Kelso and Kath, they they told me about the dance, you right. know, the feeling of the dance. Jackie told me, he said, you know, like when you play jazz, he said, you gotta you gotta be two stepping, you know, when right. you're playing. Right. He said, mm-hmm. when we played jobs, people were dancing in front of us. Right, right, right. What do you th- what do you that think about that? Musicians that inspires musicians and musicians inspired the dancers. You know, um, playing with the Harlem Renaissance. You know, and uh, Swing 46, it's it's a beautiful feeling. You see people get up and, and they feel you. You know, they, they know the tempos and you watch them and that inspires us as musicians. So dancing is very important. The Void Ballroom, my father used to tell me, my mother used to, and he used to go up there to check out Count Basie and different bands up there. And um, people are dancing, having a great time, a great time. And they learned, they learned at that time, they learned the solos too. You can record something and they would, they would be able to sing the soul. They were really into the music. It made a big difference in the relationship between the musician and the listener or the musician and the dancers too. They knew the music very well. So tell, tell me some more about your going out. You said you went out with Jack McDuff a little bit. You had tenor and alto. You remember what you telling me all that? But in the cast yes. from Canada and, and, and the whole thing, man. Okay. Well, I went out with Jack McDuff. I left a good teaching job. Actually, it was the best teaching job I have ever had. But, you know, I wanted to play music, you know. So, and the first gig I did, we went rolling out. We were supposed to leave around 8 o'clock at night. We didn't leave till about midnight in a station wagon. And we had a flat tire. It was a snowstorm. By the time we got to the gig, um, I had to help him out with the organ. It was, a, it was actually a dance. That was the first job we played was a dance. And, um, as I was getting dressed, he started playing. And I jumped in there. And then after that, we had to, um, we rehearsed. That was a Saturday night. We rehearsed. A lot of people think musicians just play their horns. They go out and party and whatnot. Chase a lot of women, drink and all that. We rehearsed. <laughs> Jack had the small keyboard. And he, he rehearsed. He worked on some new tunes, some old tunes. And by the time we played Cincinnati, we were ready. We had to play six nights. And um, playing with him, 
He made a comment to me one time. He said, don't play that defensive like a schoolboy. Like, in other words, don't play like, you know, things we practice and stuff like that. He wanted the most soulful. He, he was a blues player. He was strictly blues. He could play some blues. Any tempo, any key, he was a great, great blues player. So that's where jazz comes from, the blues and that feeling, you know. The further we get away from that, people are not going to, um, they're going to just sit up there in the chairs and look at it. Oh, that's nice. You know, so it's a different kind of feeling when you're playing the blues and watch the people's reaction to the feeling. That's very important. So playing with Jack McDuff and other people that were older, and I, I listened to Jack McDuff when I was in high school. He had George Benson, Red Holloway, and Joe Dukes. Oh, now, Joe Dukes, that was a band. Damn. That was a band. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And uh, Joe Dukes was actually the star of the group. There's a record called Soulful Drums. Mm -hmm. And he was still in the band when I played with the band, so I loved that. Mm. You know, so, um, you know, he messed with jo uh, George Benson, too. Play those blues. You know, George liked to play a lot of notes, but get get to the blues. And George himself says he's not really a blues player, you know. So um, Red Holloway can play the blues, the tenor player. You know, so it was experience. So when you play with the older guys, they're more into the feeling and playing blues and, and swing. Very important. Can't tap your foot. What good is it? <laughs> you know? Right. I Look, I completely... Uh, I don't even know where to start. My my comment my comment raised a little bit of ire with some people, but but I pointed out what 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 I had heard in the band because I, I was you know blessed to get to play with Frank Foster and Frank West and and Mel Wanzo and and and, and Cleve Eaton and all the cats who played with Basie, and and the actual quote one day was what what Grover actually said once. He said, "This is a goddamn blues band playing the blues, damn it." <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And and mm -hmm. a lot of people don't know that Basie was two things. And it's true. And everyone told me it was a blues band and it was a dance band. Mm -hmm. And no matter how sophisticated the arrangements would get at any time, you know, that element was always at the root of it. And, mm -hmm. and um it's so hard to explain this to some some of the young people that you gotta touch the people's hearts, you know, mm -hmm. just all this scientific chalkboard licks that we memorize what to play over a course. Mm -hmm. i remember i met plas johnson once man and, we're, and, mm. and, and i was just so because jackie kelso it, it passed away so i went to plas's house with my with my wife and so um, he wanted to play a little bit man we played some cherokee and i'm all in the trying to play my licks over the 12 key cherokee and he's just mm -hmm. kind of playing through it in this natural way and giving me mm -hmm. a lesson you know what i'm saying yeah yeah sure. so at the end of the lesson lesson my lesson <laughs> i said what do you think about when you get to the bridge he said marshall I, he said he said, I never think about playing a two, five, one change or a pattern I played. I play mm -hmm. what I hear. I'm playing what I hear on the saxophone. Mm -hmm. And I, I yeah. was, it was just, I knew that's what I was supposed to do, but you get caught up in the method. How yeah. do you feel? How do you feel about that? I, I totally agree. Um, especially the older guys, they, they play what they hear and it's, it's more natural. Instead of playing like a lot of licks of things that you heard or practice, and that's that's true improvisation, you know. Um, sometimes I feel like I played better. Like when I first started out, when I played with the first person I ever played with was Larry Young, and I just played by ear because I didn't know anything, and he would he would he would accompany like I knew what I was doing. I didn't at all. I just played. I just used my ear, you know. Um, playing with a lot of groups I played with, you you have to use your ears. It's very important. You might not know the tune. I worked with um the first gig I did with Panama Francis, we were in um at the Village Gate, and the tune was I may be wrong. I think I had never heard that tune before, and we had to go out there by ourselves and solo. So you had to use your ears. You know, it, it was either you did that or get off the stage. You know, so um, it was like trial by fire, you know, and playing um, with a lot of the older guys was like that, playing um, with singers, a lot of singers, they sing tunes that a lot of instrumentalists don't play, but they sing, sing them in different keys, odd keys. One musician said, 
what's the wrong key? I said, what do you mean it's the wrong key? That's the key they feel comfortable in, so we have to deal with it. That's it. There's 12 keys. You, you got to be ready to play in any key, you know? So all that experience helps you as a musician. You can never get too, um, like, think you know it all. Nobody knows it all. You can always learn something. And that's what I try to do ever since I started playing. I try to steal from people. I hear something I like. <laughs> I'm working in what I'm doing. You know, right. I'm a thief. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, so what were some of the, you told me some stories about the Canadian cat came down and playing tenor and you were playing mostly alto with McDuff mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and, and McDuff was kind of schooling you in a gentle way when he wanted to hear, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Well, well, what was happening was, um, he was from, what was he from Ohio? And, um, actually the guitar player brought him because uh, that was his friend. He mm. wanted his friend to get on the gig, mm. but other tenor play wasn't that strong. You know, he wasn't he he wasn't into Jack wanted more of like the uh, Stanley Tarantino or um, you know that that kind of style. And that's what this saxophone player provided. And we would go all over the country picking up different tenor players. That's what I noticed. A lot of them played like that. Somehow he found those people, those different musicians that play like that. You know, and I was I was practicing my stuff, you know, I'm playing alto, so I'm thinking like um between Charlie Parker and um who else? Well, I was trying to play lead also, trying to be strong and lead the, the saxophone section. Yeah. So that that was a great experience. And listening to other saxophone players all over the country, you know, it's great. Wow. And you can't you can't do that like you just stay in one place. And you just play with the same people, you're not going to hear that. But you got to get around and hear other people, you know, because one person in one city might be great, but you go to another place, you say, oh, wow, you know. So you never know. who Somebody can come up, look like um, they come from the farm, you know, and come and, and blow their butt off. You, you, know. you, you you told him i think your quote was you said every city we went to there was some great tenor player came in mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's true yeah <laughs> but the one i remember the one in battle creek michigan he he um you know there was the whole junior walker band junior walker all-stars he had his gear mm. and everything wow. but when jack called uh around midnight he didn't know that so i pulled my tenor out for that and he <laughs> called uh another tune it was around midnight and um oh dun, da, 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 da. oh moments notice yeah mm, he mm. couldn't really handle that because he was more of a bluesy type of player right, right you know so i had to i had to uh get my props on that <laughs> so, Those so, dudes. so you uh, did you get private lessons to study jazz you just learn off a record uh, what was your procedure for trying to learn learn the music and, 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 and could you tell us what years these were too? So people... <laughs> okay. Uh in 1962, I started high school. Yeah. 1963, that's when I started playing saxophone. I listened to Gene Ammons. Um I thought Gene Ammons was the greatest, but they built that's what I heard Sonny Stitt when I was 14. My father took me to hear him. So I had to had to do like uh, Gene Ammons is the best. They built Sonny Stitt the greatest saxophonist in the world. But when I heard Sonny Stitt, it changed my life around, hmm. turned it around. I mean, it was so great. Um, but mostly my learning was from records. The friends I had around me, we would just listen to records and played and got a group together and played as much as we could. My first year at Hartford, Connecticut, and went to Hart College of Music. I got there because my neighbor lived around the corner from me. She did well there. That was Dion Ward. And um, the, the training I got there, there was a blind piano player named Vince from New Jersey. He played like Bud Powell. Huh. Then you had a trumpet player from Long Island, Bob Whitehead. And there's a couple musicians there. And also, we had an instructor who was a valve trombonist. He said, listen to Lester Young. Charlie Parker, first Lester Young, the melodicism. And Lester had a way of playing. Vince also told me to listen to Lester Young. And I would follow him around. We'd go into practice rooms and I would steal from him. He would play, I would listen, and I would play, kind of play what he would play, or play, play with him, 
But he taught me a lot just from listening and learning. That's the way Jackie McLean learned from Bud Powell. Hmm. I heard an interview with him. He said um, he would go by Bud's house. Bud didn't really instruct him. He just started playing. And Jackie started playing with him because he listened okay. to Charlie Parker. Ex ex explain. I know what you mean, but explain what you mean because this, this is really important, what you just said. Can you okay. Well, it's a language. And um, I guess being, you know, any language you have to listen and you imitate, just like a foreign language. So that's what Jackie did when he was with uh, Bud Powell. He listened. He was very young. He didn't know. I don't think he knew any theory at the time. And Bud Powell would play. He would go over his house all the time and he would hear the way Bud played, played and that, that went through Jackie's playing. It's the so same then, thing I dealt with. So he, so he picked it up by ear, like by like, ear. like say totally like when, say like when you learn to speak as a baby, you don't learn to yeah. write first. You right. learn to speak just by imitating your mama. That's right, imitation, right, imitation. And I was doing a lot of imitating because I never heard anybody play like that, like way this piano player played. And that's what I wanted to learn how to play like. And then he told me who to listen to. And I, that's the first time I ever heard a great recording of George Coleman also, because there was a saxophone player named Warren who introduced me to George Coleman playing um, Miles Davis in Europe. Mm -hmm. He played a solo. I took one of those licks. And I put it in all keys. Mm -hmm. That's how I started practicing. Wow. I would take certain things I, I listened, I learned, I liked, I put it in different keys, you know? So that was my practice. And um, I was going on the right track by listening to people I like. And I, I, studied, I studied a few times with George Coleman and his thing was playing in different keys and, and um, the two five ones. So I learned a lot like that. But most of my learning has been on record. Huh. You know, I would listen and, and imitate. And then, you know, the more you play, you, you create some of your own things. Instead of playing it this way, you're playing it a different way, but in the same style, you know? No, I, I, I do know. For for instance, uh, um, sometimes I, I've visited college classrooms or something like that, mm -hmm. and then the, the, the professor will write up, say, a, a dominant chord or a half diminished chord on the chalkboard and label the number mm -hmm. as one, you know, which I know, of course, but uh, all this, you know, or maybe some pattern, right? Right. And so then, then I, I started once explaining to the students that basically kind of like when you're in Lionel Hampton's band or in Kansas City, you just you just learn music orally first before you someone tells you what a one, three, five, seven, nine is, you mm -hmm. know, and I would demonstrate by saying a lot of those blues that Basie and Lionel play were just made up on the spot, just made up tunes because people were dancing. So yep. you learn to say, do ba do ba do ba do da ba do 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 ba And then I would play to them, boo boo do ba do ba do ba do Now try to play that, you know, some folks be lost, right? You know, but after mm. a while, some people get it. And that's really what the oral language and transference of jazz should be. And that's what I hear missing from this scientific music in 7 4, 13 4, 16 yeah. 3, and all this stuff. And the yeah. audience has run away so fast, you can't even mm -hmm. find them no more. You that's know right. what I'm and, yeah. and the reason why the Count Basie band has still been so popular is because it's fun. Mm -hmm. It brings people joy. Yeah, yeah. How do you, how do you feel about that, man? Absolutely. I remember listening to um, when I was younger, like I don't know, maybe ten. And you know, New Year's Eve, they'd have these concerts on Channel Nine or Channel Eleven. I remember mean, it was positive compared to these commercials, and I would see the Count Basie band. And one tenor player would come out to the front, and the next one would come out. They would have a battle. Boy, that was that was, that intrigued me. It was <laughs> Frank Foster and Frank West, huh. you know. And um, man, that that was great. I mean, that was so much joy to me as a young person. And then hearing them in person, and then playing with both of them in person, it was it was it was great. Because like you said. You know, you, you develop riffs. When I played with Panama Francis, everybody in that band was from some, like every territory black band in the United States. And they were all old musicians. 
I even played with Howard Johnson, the alto player that played um, in Dizzy's band. Dizzy's first band, he had Howard Johnson as lead alto. So I learned, you know, a lot from just, I would talk to him to listen to him on the bandstand. There was a tenor player by the name of George Kelly, that most people never heard of. Um, bad tenor player, he played the style of Coleman Hawkins. I would hear him play in Body and Soul every night. And, and just listening to him and playing with them and try to, I had to try to fit in, not so much Charlie Parker style, but more swing. That was the original swing. That wasn't the imitation swing. That was the swing. And they would play stuff sometimes without arrangements. They would make up the arrangements. You have to create your own part in that arrangement. That was a lot of fun. But that's what the old, that's what Count Basie's band used to do. All the territory bands did, you know. But that, a lot I, of, lot I, of told, fun. I told folks there never was an arrangement for jumping at the woodside. Mm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I remember yeah. the first, I remember the first time I subbed in the band, the cat said, you know, we were playing jumping at the woodside. Where's the music? Oh, I ain't no music, man. Just just listen to you. Yeah. <laughs> right, 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 right. <laughs> <laughs> yes, indeed. Because what it was is a, a lot of those tunes were just riffs. They're just and that's what Lionel Hampton made you do. You remember Lionel Hampton makes you play behind him all the time. You know, I'm a clean mm -hmm. guy. Me sit beside me. He be, he be or Mark Gross be shooting you licks to play. And man, your ear uh, starts to get sharp after a while. You start oh, to yeah. you start to grow because yeah. it's a language, but it's also an energy and intensity. This this blues that Lionel was Lionel would build the audience up to. They're jumping up, going you know like this. And it's, mm -hmm. I just that's just fun, man. I'm sorry. That's, yeah. You know, and see another thing back in those days, they were playing every night. I had a gig with Panama Francis at the Rainbow Room six nights a week. Mm -hmm. every, you know, so you can't play the same stuff every night. Hmm. So you, you have to learn like that. You have to. That's why I took the fight. You, there's no way in the world you can't learn by playing with these experienced masters and being around them playing six nights a week for two, three months. I played with Grover, uh, Grover Mitchell. I played baritone, and um, he had he had the Count Basie high for the Count Basie band there. You know, that was a lot of fun. So I played with um, Earl Warren. Matter of fact, you heard Earl Warren. He's lead wow. auto player. Wow. I've, on, I've only met, I've only only met his wife. I never met. Her. Really? Yeah. Oh man, <laughs> when I was in high school, he had a um, for local sixteen in North like a saxophone group about 50 saxophones mm -hmm. and i me and my friend were the youngest there he boy he get on this hard swing you know he was rough but he's no nonsense person i heard he taught the count bass and saxophone section how to play together and different things you know wow. maybe how to read he mm -hmm. was he was a master man and mm -hmm. people like that the lead players lead out the players you listen to them um let me give you a story about frank west I was subbing for him in uh, Annie. Actually, he, he played the alto. When he took off, I would play um, flute and clarinet because the person that played flute and clarinet moved up to the alto chair. One day, Frank and I played together at the same time. Man, he made that music come alive. I mean, it was so good, I almost lost my place <laughs> because... It's one thing reading music, but he he played through the music. He uplifted the music. It's it's incredible. I mean, when it, when you have a great lead alto player, you can you can hear the difference. Not just neat reading notes. And I learned I learned a lot just by listening to him that one time, leading the section. That's deep, you know? man. Yeah, that that's really what it's all about.